So last week we dealt with 1st and 2nd Corinthians. This week we're going to look at Galatians and Ephesians. Next week, it's a, it's a threefer, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Um, then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, we're doing Philippians, Colossians, uh, Philemon together because the further along in Paul's letters you get, the shorter they get. Philemon's the last one and it's the shortest, but I brought it together with, with Philippians and Colossians. And then we'll do three on the sixth week, the pastoral epistles, meaning the ones that Paul wrote as a pastor to two of his uh, disciples, two of the people that he was mentoring, who themselves have become pastors, and that is Timothy and Titus, so first and second Timothy and Titus, and then week seven, we'll deal in the first hour with the significance of Paul, and the second hour, the final exam. Again, I will have the document for you in week five, which will be all the things you need to know from this class. So you can study that, study it for your own benefit, but I would recommend that you study it with an eye toward taking the, the test, the final exam. There are always 50 questions. There are always multiple choice. You don't have to memorize things. There's no fill in the blank. There's no essay questions. So you will learn more if you, if you do that, and I encourage it. Um, the Apostle Paul, we've looked at. I always want to remind everybody that he was bald. Uh, so um, these, this list, which I'm showing every week because I want us to get familiar with it, these are all of the letters of Paul. The difference between this list and the list you're accustomed to is this is the list, as best we know, of the chronological order. Now, I say as best we know, I believe this is an accurate list. Some people believe that 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written before Galatians, and we're going to talk about that today because we're going to talk about Galatians. It has to do with the theory of who was Paul writing the letter to the Galatians to, because that then affects when he wrote it, and whether or not it came before or after 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, I am of the belief that Galatians was the first of Paul's letters, and probably the second of the letters written in the entire New Testament, the first one being the book of James. So James and Galatians, and we're going to talk about the fact that that's uh, interesting and a little bit ironic, because James and Galatians have often been seen as, as contradicting each other. They don't. But you do have to have an understanding of what the two are talking about and, and what the difference is. Because James seems to be saying that you have to have works. Faith without works is dead, from the book of James. Whereas Galatians is entirely about the fact that works will not get you saved. So much so, and, and because Galatians had been so important to Martin Luther when he started the Protestant Reformation, that Luther did not especially care for the book of James. He called it a right straw epistle. And he put it in the back of his Bible so he didn't have to flip through it when he was looking for something else. He didn't reject it completely. And, and in fact, sometimes I think people overplay Luther's problems with the book of James. But we'll talk about that difference uh, today as we talk about Galatians. James, of course, was not written by Paul. It was written by James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the Jerusalem Council. Okay? So, but these are the letters. Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1st Timothy, Titus, and 2nd Timothy, in chronological order. This chart, like all the other materials here, is also online. You can go online, pull this chart up, pull up the outlines and the other materials so that you, if you want to, print them out and have them as your own resource, okay? I am very careful. This comes from a book. The purchase of the books gives me a right to reproduce this as long as I don't do it for profit. And so anything like this that I put up here is something that is, um, is unlicensed or that by purchasing the materials it came from, I've purchased the right to reproduce them. I feel very strongly, no matter what the habit is of a lot of people here in Mexico, we, I and we at our church do not use uh, copyrighted materials that we have not purchased a license for. Okay. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, videos, for instance, we pay license fees whenever we do a video for a movie night here. Um, and if somebody just goes to in front of Super Lake and buys those videos, they're participating in theft because those are all pirated. And when you buy them, you are in effect stealing, or you at least are participating in stealing. If you go to the Tianguis and you go to the guy who, who will make copies of computer programs for you and you give him 100 pesos for a $350 computer program, you're stealing. So just so you know, <laughs> uh, next time you're, you're tempted to go to Super Lake and buy those videos, don't. You know, it's a really bad witness because those things are illegal. So anyway, and people have argued, well, they're not, well, I had one minister argue with me, well, it's not illegal in Mexico, and the next week the federales busted those guys. <laughs> so, uh, uh, all right, so 
we've looked at this map before, and uh, we'll look at it again. These, uh, this map is the Eastern Mediterranean. Obviously, you'll recognize the, the toe and, uh, of Italy and the island of Sicily. This is what we know of as Greece today. This area is Turkey today. It was Asia Minor at that time, although it was broken up in, in smaller provinces, and we're going to get into that. This would have been Syria. This is what we know as Syria. This is what we know of as Israel. Uh, Lebanon is in there. Okay. Um, so this gives you an idea. These cities are the the major cities in Paul's life. Paul was Paul of Tarsus, or Saul of Tarsus, as he was originally called, came from here, Tarsus, which was a major university city. Um, he spent his most of his youth and early adulthood in Jerusalem, where he was trained by the most famous teacher of his day, Gamaliel, in the Jewish faith. He then was on his way to Damascus when he was confronted by the resurrected Lord. He ended up um, going, spending time in Damascus and then going off into Arabia, down here, to pray, to grow. He was there for some time. Came back up to Damascus, ended up going to Tarsus, where uh, Barnabas... The, the son of encouragement, one of the most positive uh, characters in the, the whole book of Acts in the New Testament, came and found him in Tarsus and took him back to Antioch to help lead a new church there. Then, uh, through their missionary trips, they planted churches all over Asia Minor. Um, two of them were Colossae, which he wrote the book of Colossians to, and Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. He also traveled across to Europe. This is Asia. This is Europe. So he traveled from Asia to Europe, taking the gospel to Philippi, to Berea, which is not listed here, Thessalonica. These are listed because he wrote the books of Philippians and uh, Thessalonians to there. The city of Corinth, we talked about last week, the book of Corinthians. Um, Malta is on here because when he was taken to Rome uh, under arrest, it was a shipwreck. That it, usually if you look at maps that show the pattern, you know, the path of the boat, it'll get to this part and it goes because they were blown by the wind in the storm. They shipwrecked on Malta, and then he went to Rome. Okay, so these are the major cities, at least the major cities in the Eastern Mediterranean, that were the key in Paul's life. I say at least the cities in the Eastern Mediterranean because there is very strong tradition. We don't have any written documentation, but there is strong tradition that Paul, after he was first arrested and spent two years under house arrest in Rome, was then released and went to Spain. And Paul had, had commented several times, and Romans especially, uh, he says, I am looking forward to going to Spain. He's writing to the church in Rome, uh, in the book of Romans, and he says, on my way to Spain, which I hope to do soon, I hope to come and visit you on my way. Well, the tradition says that he went to Spain, and there's some tradition even that he went around the Iberian Peninsula, around Spain and Portugal, and went up to Great Britain, and then came back was rearrested, and the very strong tradition is that he was beheaded in Rome. Beheaded, not crucified like Peter was, because Peter was a Jew, Paul was a Roman citizen. Although he was a Jew, he was a Roman citizen as well, and Roman citizens could not be crucified. And so the tradition is, both Peter and Paul were executed as martyrs in Rome, Peter was crucified, tradition says Peter did not want to be uh, to die in the same way that his Lord did, the same way Jesus did, so he requested that he be crucified upside down. Um, Again, we have no factual support for that. And Paul, likewise, very strong tradition, said he was martyred in Rome the second time he was there, and he was he died by beheading, which makes sense, the fact that he was a Roman citizen. Becky, do you have something? I was wondering, what was what did they actually charge him with? I mean, do we know? Well, sedition. Um, anything that was seen as the two big... <laughs> crimes that you could commit in the Roman Empire, the two that would really get you in trouble really fast, was um, opposition to, the, to Roman rule, especially the emperor's will. Anything that violated um, loyalty or um, dedication to the emperor. And that included, later on, people who refused to worship the emperor, because emperor worship became, very, became a dominant force later on. You had emperors who insisted on being called Lord and God. And you spoke to them. Well, not worshiping the emperor was considered an act of sedition, meaning uh, um, an act against the government. The other thing that would get you in trouble really, really fast was anything that caused public disorder in the areas that Rome controlled. This is the reason why Paul was originally arrested. It's because he comes back to Jerusalem, 
and a bunch of the, the Jews in the temple had heard about him, and they jump him. Later on, they claim that he had brought a Gentile into the, into the inner courts of the temple, which was not permitted. In fact, it was a sign that said, Gentiles enter here at your own risk, basically. Um, and so they accused Paul of that, although there's no indication that was really that really happened. Well, the Romans come pouring out of Antonia Fortress, which was literally adjacent to the to the courtyard of the Gentiles. The door they had doors that opened out into the temple courtyards. They run out, grab him, take him in, because anything that created um, or threatened to create a riot or a rebellion or anything of that sort, the Romans would clamp down on immediately. Because the whole Roman Empire, which was the whole Mediterranean, you know, they, they controlled all the property in the first century around the whole Mediterranean. You read stories that they, they refer to it as the Roman Lake, the Mediterranean Sea. Well, almost all of that was conquered property, everything other than the city of Rome and the area right around it. And so they were always fearful that somebody was going to rise up in rebellion. And so the minute somebody started causing trouble, the very first thing the Romans would do is step on their neck really hard. And so that would get you in trouble. So following a new religion, following a religion and that the, the followers of which were not willing to bow down before the emperor and worship him, um, there were problems that were created because the Jews in Rome, for instance, were, you know, were battling against their own people, the Jews who had become Christians. Nero, uh, or rather Claudius, actually threw all of the Jews out of Rome at one point. They came back. And then under Nero, apparently the, the, the Jews were having trouble with the Jewish Christians, the, the Jews that had converted, and so that's what led to the first persecution in Rome in the, in the 50s, in the middle of the first century. So any of those things would have been enough reason. The Romans didn't have to have a big reason, you know, any excuse at all. If they felt like it was a, a, in any way a threat to public order, then they would take drastic action, including execution for whoever was leading that. And, if they were Roman citizens. Well, and Roman citizens affected how they could be treated and how they could be executed, but did not prevent them from being executed. Again, Paul was not crucified, he was beheaded. If he had just been a Jew and not a Jew who was a Roman citizen, he would probably be crucified. Okay? Alright, so, all that kind of background. So today, we are going to be talking about Galatians, which you see this this right here, and also we're going to be talking about Ephesians, the two books. Now, as you know, because we've talked about this, Paul went on three missionary journeys. Some people call his trip to Rome a missionary journey because when he got to Rome, he preached for two years under house arrest. Some people say he had a fifth trip, which was to Spain and, uh, and perhaps Britain. But the first missionary journey Paul and Barnabas took, they left Antioch and they sailed to Cyprus, the town of uh, Salamis, then crossed the island to Paphos, and from there took a boat up to Perga, and visited these cities. Antioch of Pisidia, it's called Antioch of Pisidia, because Pisidia was this the region, as opposed to Antioch of Syria. Antioch of Syria was a major city. Antioch of Pisidia was a, you know, fairly insignificant town. So he visited, they visited Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and, and, and then they went back, the same route. They planted churches in each of those places. Now, there, there were Jews in all of those towns, because there were Jews everywhere at this point, but most of these were predominantly Gentile areas, and so the churches there became predominantly Gentile churches with some Jewish members. And that becomes an issue later on, the, the, the combination of Jewish and Gentile in terms of Christians uh, becomes an issue in a number of cases. So they come back and they leave uh, Atalia, which is modern-day Atanalia in Turkey. It's a major resort area. Um, some spectacular Roman ruins just outside the city of Atanalia. Um, the most complete Roman theater, uh, intact Roman theater anywhere in the world is there. Yes, Pam? No. I'm oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, you, anytime your hand gets higher than your lips, I'm going to call it. <laughs> and then from there, they sailed back to Antioch. That was their trip. And then they made a trip down to Jerusalem. But the key point here is that they planted churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Now, you don't see Galatia anywhere there. There are two, well, I, I guess I should, I'll do it in this order. Then the second missionary trip, Paul went overland with Cyrus. He didn't go by boat again, but he went overland and he stopped at Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and then traveled up to Troy, 
uh, felt, had a vision of a man from Macedonia, which is over here, northern Greece, as we know it. Um, a man from Macedonia saying, come across and help us. So from Troas, he caught a boat, and they went across Neapolis, Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, Berea, down to Athens, which is where he had the, the interaction with the philosophers on Mars Hill. Um, and then to Corinth, we talked about. From there, he came back to Ephesus. And in Ephesus, he spent between two and a half and three years in Ephesus. The longest period he spent in any one place. He spent about 18 months in Corinth, but, uh, which was the second longest period. But the, these churches here, you'll see Galatia up here, right? Um, and then Ephesus, I wanted to mention. So the first two missionary trips... He visited the churches in what we call Galatia, here, twice. He planted them the first time, visited them again the second time. And then in the second missionary journey, he visited Ephesus. When we get to Ephesians, we'll talk about the fact that he visited Ephesus um, um, twice, and then bypassed it once because he was afraid they'd hang on to him if he, stuck, if he, he went there. So, um, this is important. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this general stuff, and then we'll talk about the northern and southern theories. Yes, Pam. I do have a question. If you go back to the map, do me a favor and kind of tell me, since everybody's walking, how far all of this is now? I understand the boat part, but we're talking, you know, uh, 100 miles? So oh, no. 200? Well, it's 100 miles from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, over 100 miles. So when they're walking this, my guess is that the walking part of this trip was probably 800 to 1,000 miles. Ooh. Now, part of the time he would have walked, part of the time he may have been on a donkey. Nobody rode horses unless they were soldiers. Anytime you read horse in the Bible, it means military, because that's the only thing horses were used for. If they rode something, it was a mule or a donkey. Other than that, they were walking. Okay? Aaron? Um, I was just wondering about the languages that Paul may have spoken. Was it just Greek and Hebrew, or would he have known others? Well, he certainly would have spoken, we, we know for a fact, he spoke Hebrew and Greek, and he would have spoken Aramaic, because the common language of the day was Aramaic, not Hebrew. Hebrew was, was the traditional religious language, and that's what the, the Hebrew Bible was written in. But Aramaic, because the, the Hebrew people... Had the Jewish people had been taken into captivity in the, the 6th century BC into Babylon, and they were there for probably three generations, the people learned Chaldean, which is ancient Babylonian, which was related to Aramaic. It sort of developed into Aramaic over time. So in the 600 years between the start of the Jewish captivity in Babylon and the time of Jesus, because they had several generations of speaking the language of the Babylonians, Aramaic became the common language of the day. And then after Alexander the Great in the 3rd century, um, it was Greek became so dominant that, uh, or in the 4th century, that people forgot how to speak Hebrew. They forgot how to read Hebrew. This is why in the 200s, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, the Septuagint, because a lot of Jewish people couldn't, couldn't even read Hebrew anymore. They couldn't read their own Bible. So they translated into Greek so that pretty much everybody could. But one of the things that happened here is that even though, like Macedonian, Macedonia had its own language, but everybody spoke Greek, too. You know, Alexander the Great, by the way, was not Greek. He was Macedonian. I actually had a Greek man argue with me about that on a recent trip we had, and I said, I'm sorry, you can say whatever you want to. He loved Greece. He loved the, the Greek legends and stories. He saw he associated himself with the great warrior Achilles. He thought he might even be the reincarnation. He thought he was the son of Zeus, you know, and so he spoke Greek. He loved the Greek myths and legends and all of that, but he actually wasn't Greek. He was Macedonian, and his mother tongue would have been Macedonian, not Greek. But everybody spoke Greek. Okay. Yes, Bob? What about chariots? It seems like I remember some story about Philip being on a chariot. Actually, uh, chariots were for military purposes, too, because chariots were drawn by horses. What happened is, if somebody was a, 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 an official of a state, and they were traveling some distance, then they could be assigned a chariot. The reason Philip was on a chariot is he's walking, and he comes upon the Ethiopian eunuch, who is from the court of the Queen of Sheba. 
And the Ethiopian eunuch is in a chariot because he is in, he's in Israel on an official mission. And so they had given him transportation. They loaned him one of the company cars. Okay, it's a government vehicle. And so he was, he was in a chariot. But that's the only reason Philip ended up in one, was because he came up and found this Ethiopian reading the book of Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy said, how can I understand unless somebody explains it? So Philip said, well, I can explain it. And that's how he ended up with the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot. So otherwise, chariots were entirely military. You know, they, they were not used for anything either. The, the governments would have them, and in this case, they'd given him one to travel in, but not ordinarily. Uh, an ordinary citizen wouldn't have. What about camels? Camels are not used in this area. I mean, parts of Syria probably would use them in crossing the desert, but, but this, you know, the, this area that wasn't really desert, I mean, there's some rough areas in there, but it's not like when you get down in the Sinai Peninsula, in the Arabian Desert, the Syrian Desert. Um, camels were almost exclusively used for crossing deserts, because, and, and they were not ordinary transportation. Again, for ordinary citizens, uh, the Bedouins used them. They were Bedouins back then, even though they're the same as they are now. Um, as caravan, because they could also hold a lot of goods, but in terms of Every ordinary, everyday ordinary transportation? No. People didn't use them. Okay? Because this, this, surprisingly enough, really isn't camel territory. I mean, if you go there today, unless you get out into the desert areas, you know, there aren't camels in, in the common areas around, you know, populated areas around Israel, even the populated areas where that might seem an appropriate way to get from point A to point B. So, and that's always been true. Rich? If Paul never visited Colossae, how come he wrote them Colossians? Uh, um, well, he wrote letters to other churches, even that he didn't visit. Oh, he had yeah. not visited the church in Rome before yeah. he wrote that letter. In fact, he didn't visit Rome until he got <clears throat> arrested and taken there. Um, Colossae was one, is one of the seven churches of the... Um, Revelation. Of Revela well, no, it's not. No, it's not. Take that back. It's not. There was a church there. In fact, yeah, see, see these with the uh, crosses? Oh, Laodicea, Philippi, Sardis, Thyatira, um, Smyrna. Pergamum, Smyrna, and Ephesus were the seven churches of, of the book of Revelation. We, in the trip I took two years ago, visited all of those except Thyatira because there's nothing there. I mean, there, you know, the others, there's just some places, minimal ruins, but there's something there. There was nothing in Thyatira. Uh, but Colossae... We stayed in Colossae. Um, it was a fairly large-sized town for that area, and there was a church planted there, but there were other people involved in ministry and mission there, not just Paul. I mean, he planted the churches over here, but then later on, before the book of Colossians was written, churches were planted in almost all over this place. Timothy became the bishop, first a pastor and then the bishop of Ephesus. John, the apostle, lived in Ephesus and was considered like the senior elder bishop you know, would, would be a, a, the title we would use today for all of the churches of uh, Western Asia Minor. And in fact, when he got too old to really walk very far, they would carry him from town to town in a sedan chair so that he could go and preach and, you know, pastor and minister to people. So there was a lot of other ministry activity going on there besides just Paul. But Paul planted these churches, and in Paul's first visit to Ephesus, um, he may have been the one who first planted the faith in Ephesus. But very quickly, there were a lot of other people that were involved there. Okay? And then from there, a lot of other churches in the region get planted. Okay? Even places that Paul never went to. All right? Okay, let's talk about the book of Galatians. Uh, written by Paul the Apostle. This is one of the letters that people don't, don't really question whether Paul wrote it. Probably written about AD 47 to 49. Uh, making it perhaps the oldest of Paul's letters and the second oldest book in the New Testament. And I'm going to talk about probably in just a moment. Recipients, we believe, were the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. And Roman province is important there. Probably those that were begun by Paul and Barnabas in the cities of Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe during his first missionary journey. And then he revisited them in his second missionary journey. The major theme is justification is by grace through faith in Christ alone. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and His grace. It has nothing to do with works. That's what this book is all about. And that's exactly why the book of Galatians was so influential to Martin Luther and so critical 
to the entire Protestant Reformation. Galatians has been called the Magna Carta. You know, the Magna Carta was the great declaration of freedom by the, the English lords over, you know, under the king. That the king couldn't just do whatever he wanted. It was a, it was a symbol of freedom. Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of evangelical Christianity because it is a declaration of freedom in Christ, not bondage under the law. That's the whole message. And there's a reason why that's the message he's writing to the Galatians. Perhaps, I'm going to give you some other verses here, but Galatians 2.16 is, is a good summary of that. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, just by observing the law, uh, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Okay. Um, this is a different version of that same map, but I'm showing it to you because this, this adds something. Again, the first trip by boat to Cyprus, up here, to Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and then back again. Second trip from here, he visited them overland. You see up here, Galatia. There are two theories about who this letter is written to. The traditional historic province or, or region called Galatia was up north. It, these were not part of that. They're up here. Galatia was settled by Celtic people. That's right, Celtic, like as in Scandinavian uh, or Irish. You know, they're Celts as well, but they, they all came from the Vikings. Viking people had settled in the area of Gaul, which we know of as what? France. 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 Gaul. Well, some of those same Vikings, it's astonishing if you ever do a study of this, how many different places the Vikings ended up. <clears throat> Vikings who had originally settled in Gaul, looking for new lands to conquer, had left there and moved to the far east and settled up here. And so this became the land known as the, the land of the Galatians. Galatians. Originally, it was its own kingdom up here in the north. Because, I mean, north, cold, mountains, Scandinavian Vikings. It did not include down here. One theory is that in Paul's second missionary journey, he actually wandered up here. And, and we have no record of that. It's not in the book of Acts, which is a... See, the, the letters tell us what Paul thought and wrote and gives us some understanding about the problems and issues in churches. But the book of Acts is the history part. It's the part that tells us when Paul did what, where he went, Paul and Peter and others. But more than half of the book of Acts is the journeys of Paul. Okay. So some people believe that because this was the ancient kingdom of Galatia, that when Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia, it means that in his second missionary journey, he actually, before he got to Troas, he wandered up here and planted some churches, and he's writing back to them. I believe that really strains credibility. We have no record of that. It, the only thing they really base that on, and in fact there's some strong reasons not to believe that that's the case, um, the only thing that's based upon is the ancient kingdom of Galatia was up here. But... Then the Romans came along and changed everything. The Romans, this, this outline, all of these different outlines here, those are different Roman administrative provinces. Meaning the Romans drew new lines. And they would put in place governors or proconsuls, they had several different uh, categories of people, who ruled with their administrative heads, like, like a state governor, in these various areas. And they just, they put those wherever they thought made sense, and it didn't matter what they were called before. <coughs> this red area here was the Roman province of Galatia. So they used the same name. The old Galatia stopped like right here. It was just here in the north. The Roman province of Galatia came all the way down here and would have included the cities of Antioch, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. Yes? What's the date when they... When they reconfigured the map? Uh, the third, like 25 to 35 BC was when they really took over all this area. Not too long before, uh, well, completely took over. So it was already like this, it was already distributed like this when Paul traveled. Exactly. 
Okay? Now, because it wasn't that long before Paul, really, there were some people who still referred to, when they said Galatia, they meant the old kingdom of Galatia in the north. But Paul was a Roman citizen. Oh, yeah. And was very particular. In, in fact, it's been commented on. One of, the, one of the reasons that we can believe in the reliability, the historical reliability, the veracity of the, the New Testament writings is because, I mentioned, you know, they had proconsuls and governors and all sorts of other things. The actual titles of Roman officials is bewildering, okay? Different people with different kinds of titles performing exactly the same function in different places. And yet, when you study Paul's writings, when you study Luke's writings, especially the book of Acts, he always gets it right. Paul and Luke, especially, meaning Paul's writings when he's talking, you know, and especially Luke in the book of Acts, they've got all this, they, they know exactly what the titles were and what the names were of the people, and they don't get any of that confused. When Luke says, I have studied this, I've interviewed a lot of people, and I want to give you an orderly account, it is really an orderly account. And he is clearer on what all the titles were and the people in the responsibility positions were and all of that, more so than almost most of the historians of that day. Okay? So, it makes sense that Paul, and for that matter, you know, Luke when he refers to it, would have used the Roman province names, not the more ancient names of the kingdoms. Make sense? Yeah. It's also, so, the idea that this northern area, the ancient kingdom of Galatia, that there were churches there that Paul's writing to in the book of Galatians, that's called the northern Galatian theory. The idea that the churches in Iconium, Antioch, Lystra, and Derbe that Paul planted and then revisited, that those are the churches he's referring to as Galatia, is called the Southern Galatian theory. And you'll hear that, Northern Galatian, Southern Galatian. Most scholars today accept the Southern Galatian uh, theory. Now, there's a very important reason why I think that, that's, that that one makes a lot more sense. And that is, and again, this is, you know, the, picturing those things. The whole theme of the book of Galatians, and I'm going to get into this in a little more detail, is the Galatian church, which was predominantly, not completely, but predominantly Jewish, I'm, I'm sorry, Gentile, Paul had gone there, planted a church, revisited them, and preached the gospel. Gentiles had converted to Jesus, you know, from paganism, that is. And then Paul finds out that after he had been there, others who were converted Jews, that is, Jews who had become Christians, went to Galat the Galatian churches after him and were saying basically two things. One, if you're a Gentile, in order to become a Christian and a follower of Jesus, you have to become Jewish, meaning you have to be circumcised, you have no more bacon, no more shellfish, no more activities on the, on the Jewish Sabbath, etc. You have to follow the Mosaic Law if you're going to be a Christian. That was the one thing. The second thing, major message that they had given the Galatian churches is, and stop listening to Paul. You know, Paul's a doofus. Paul is not an apostle. He's not here by the authority of the, of the original church council in Jerusalem, James, James the Just and, and Peter and the others. Um, you, do, you shouldn't listen to him. Listen to us, because we know more about this. Those were the two big things that were happening in Galatians. Now, if you read the book of Acts, Acts 15, the 15th chapter of Acts, is, is the uh, account of the Jerusalem Council. In the Jerusalem Council, Paul and Barnabas come down from Antioch to Jerusalem. Peter is there. Now, Peter... Uh, even though Peter is called the Apostle to the Jews and, P and Paul is called the Apostle to the Gentiles, for the majority of it, that's true. But the first Gentile converts were converts under the ministry of Peter. It was Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and his family in Joppa, okay, here. Um, or, I'm sorry, in Caesarea. They came from Joppa. Peter came from Joppa. Um, and so the first Gentile converts were under Peter, and Peter was the first one to say, God has anointed them with the Holy Spirit, and who is, it, who is it for us to say no? Paul, on the other hand, while most of his ministry was to Gentiles, he always went to the Jewish synagogue wherever he went. That was the first place he preached. And then he would preach in the marketplaces, etc., so the Gentiles would hear it. 
So Peter was also at the Jerusalem Council, as recorded in Acts 15. Peter, pa uh, Paul, and not Mary. Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. <laughs> because Paul and Barnabas had had the experience of the church in Antioch, which was almost entirely Gentile. They come to Jerusalem and they say, God has clearly made it uh, obvious to us, because the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that he, he wants these Gentiles, as they are, to come to him. God did not wait until they professed Jesus and got circumcised and proved that they were following the Mosaic Law before he anointed them with the Spirit. And so therefore, Paul, Barnabas, and Peter made the argument that we should not require obedience to the Jewish law of a Gentile who wants to follow Jesus. And the, the people, the, the council in Jerusalem, led by James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, agreed with that. That was the final conclusion. Gentiles do not have to become Jewish. They don't have to be circumcised in order to be Christians. The Northern Galatian theory puts the writing of the book of Galatians after the second missionary journey, which means it would have been well after the Jerusalem Council, after the decision had been made by the, the home church council in Jerusalem that, that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Well, if that had already happened... Why in the world doesn't Paul mention that? What, what was the date of that council? The, the council would have been uh, 50, AD 50. We believe that, that the uh, letter to the Galatians was written 47 to 49. We believe that this was probably like 48 to 50 is the Jerusalem council. We don't have exact dates on any of this. Okay? But the belief is, the belief of the southern uh, Galatian theory is that Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians immediately before the Jerusalem Council. In fact, the fact that this issue was affecting Galatia, as the churches in Galatia, as well as Antioch and others, may have been one of the reasons that Paul helped push to do this, you know, helped to, to have the Jerusalem Council. Because this issue was becoming a problem not just in Antioch, but in other places as well. Now, the problem is, just a second, I'll get to you, Gene. The Northern Galatian theory says that Galatians wasn't written until 57 or 58, almost a decade later, well after the Jerusalem Council. And again, since that's the whole point in Galatians, why in the world, and, and the, the two things, the arguments are, one, you have to be circumcised, you have to be Jewish. Two, don't listen to Paul because Paul is not a representative of the Jerusalem Council, he's not an apostle. The Jerusalem Council settled both of those things. You know, Paul could have written, if this happened after the Jerusalem Council, the book of Galatians was written after the Jerusalem Council, he could have said, the Jerusalem Council, the mother church, including James the Just and everybody else, has already decided on this and you don't have to be circumcised, and they affirmed my ministry, which they did in the Jerusalem Council. They gave him the right hand of fellowship and blessed his ministry and sent he and Barnabas off, you know, to continue to minister to the Gentiles. So Paul would have had immediate counter-arguments to both of the major points that were occurring, but he doesn't say that in, in Galatians, neither one of those things. It only makes sense if this letter was written before the Jerusalem Council, which means it was written earlier, it was written before the second missionary journey, I mean he revisited those churches, but written before he could have had a chance to visit Northern Galatia, or else it, it, the whole sort of timeline falls apart, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, Gene? Don't say Jerusalem. Where was the Jerusalem church? Were they still meeting in the, in the, in the temple, or did they have a place of their own? Or well, they home? there were home churches. I mean, we have uh, the book of Acts talks about the fact that they were meeting in each other's homes. Mm -hmm. But it also talks about the fact that they continued to meet in the temple courtyards. I mean, in, within the temple uh, bounds, there was like a place called Solomon's Colonnade, which is they met for a long time. And it's a huge, you know, it's it's like a colony down here, you know, arches, pillars and arches, and then there was this huge covered area, and groups would meet there. Um, at that time, the Jews, for the most part, were also still attending the times of worship in the temple. You know, we know that because Peter and Paul in the book of Acts, uh, when they, when they, the, the man who can't walk, when they raise him up, they're on their way to the temple at the usual hour of prayer, it says. John? Uh, help me with this. That would have been after the discord, and they would have been meeting in people's homes by then, under the under the guise of darkness. It says that, you know, in Acts it says everybody left Jerusalem except the apostles, which I know that's not little, but a vast majority of them left with Antioch and other places. So wouldn't that right. have been maybe they would have been not so public as they had prior, but they would have been more in people's homes and, and like 
Yeah. Well, one of the things that that um, Paul, it, see, Paul goes and he, he drags about people's homes. Yeah, that's what he said. He, he drags them. But it appears as though the persecution, the persecution that Paul was leading until his conversion on the road to Damascus, was almost exclusively against Hellenistic. Jews. But I'm talking about before when Stephen was stoned. No, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Because Stephen stoning was the start of the persecution, and that's when Paul headed to Damascus. I mean, he, he was persecuting people in Jerusalem, and then he headed to Damascus. Stephen was a Hellenized Jew. Stephen is a Greek name. It's not a Jewish name. Okay? Um, and the indication that we have, and that the fact that the apostles, who were so visible, I mean, that, that Sanhedrin knew Peter, and they knew John, and they knew the others. In fact, twice they brought Peter and John in and, and threatened them. And yet, they continued to remain in Jerusalem and were not bothered. The indication is, and there's, it doesn't actually say this, but the indication is, the primary persecution was not against all of the Jewish Christians, but against the, Jew, the Hellenized Jewish Christians. In other words, there were two groups of Jews. There were the Jews who were uh, very much committed to the Jewish tradition and faith. They had Jewish names. They're the ones that could still read Hebrew. Okay? Then there were the Hellenized Christians who had been so influenced by Greek, by the Greek culture, they had Greek names, they tended to speak Greek more than Hebrew, some of them didn't speak Hebrew at all. There was always a sense on the part of the Sanhedrin, especially the Pharisaical members of the Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees as a whole, that any of the Hellenized Jews were suspect in the first place. That they weren't really good Jews, or they would not be so Greek. Well, when these Hellenized or Greek like Jews, when they started converting to Christianity, that was the last straw. And so they started persecuting them. But the only real explanation we have, because we, the only record we have of Stephen and others who were specifically persecuted, they were Hellenized, but we know that by their names. Whereas some of the most visible and obvious members of the Jewish Christian faith, Peter, John, others, James, the just, um, James is later killed by a high priest, and, the high, and people are so angry about it, they end up killing the high priest over that. Um, this is much later, James the Just. Um, that the indication is that they were especially out to get Hellenized Jewish Christians, more so than just Jewish Christians. I think you dealt with that in one of the yeah. classes we had yeah. before. Okay. So, while it sounds like a small thing, it actually does make a difference in terms of timing and also helps us understand the message of Galatians if we understand that northern, southern, you know, differences. As I say, most scholars now accept the Southern Galatian view, both because there's no record of churches being planted up here. There's not really a time he could have, Paul could have done it uh, prior to the Jerusalem Council. And if the Jerusalem Council had already happened, then there was a really quick answer to all the problems that were occurring in the Galatian churches. And yet he doesn't mention that in his letter. Okay? So, um, any questions about that? Flip through my notes here. I've got it's, it's 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 important to note. That, you know, you just really brought this out. Is that the letter to the Galatians was not to a, a church. It was to a, a region right. of churches. A group of churches. Whereas you got Colossians and you got you got Ephesians. Right. And Rome. These were written to specific churches, but this was to a, a, an area. And in most cases. Uh, as is true here in Galatians, Paul is addressing specific problems or specific concerns, or in some cases, you know, praising them for specific. The, the book of Philippians is primarily a, a positive letter, but he's identifying that Philippians is so warm. I mean, it's it's very clear that Paul, that, uh, Paul had a very close relationship with the people he's writing Philippians. The book of Romans, he didn't know any of those people, and so that's why Romans doesn't have it doesn't address specific issues. It's much the most general theological treatise that Paul wrote. Uh, the book of Galatians is very specific about the problems of Galatian churches, even though it's not one church, it's, it's at least four churches in that area. And the book of Ephesians is second only to Rome in terms of not addressing specific problems. And we're going to talk about that in the second hour when we get into the book of Ephesians, okay? Uh, why, what some of the thought is as to why Ephesians, Ephesians is not more specific. Uh, because Paul spent more time in Ephesians than anywhere. You'd think he had better, closer relationships with them than he did the Philippians, and yet you don't get that same sense of intimacy and warmth and relational kinds of stuff in Ephesians that you do in Philippians. And all of you should be studying these books enough that you'll be able to recognize those kind of characteristics in the books, okay? <laughs> um, yesterday, in our Old Testament historical books, I did a little exercise where I told 
the history of God's working with his people. From the start of Genesis, you know, the four great acts of the primeval history in the first 11 chapters, you know, the creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And then we did Abraham, and we followed it all the way through to the time of Jesus. And I told people yesterday, you need to be able to, to tell somebody that story in five minutes to tell them the whole of the biblical story of what God has been doing to his people. It's really not that hard. But I think every Christian needs to be able to do that. Likewise, I think every book in the New Testament especially, we should be able to say generally, what is it about? One sentence. The book of Galatians is about freedom in Christ because Paul was writing to a church that people were trying to convince them they had to follow, still follow the law. Every book in the New Testament, I would challenge you all to make it your, your plan your, and make an effort that you can give in at least one sentence, you have an understanding of what each book is about. Because if you do that, even if, you don't, you know, if you don't, you're not called on to give it to somebody else, if you do that, then you will have a much clearer sense of what this is all about. I used to be, you know, before I was a Christian, and even after I became a Christian, I was a young Christian, I was as mystified by what was in the Bible as anybody, even after I'd read it the first time. Just reading through it doesn't really give you sense, but once you make the effort to learn, this is what Galatians is about, this is what Ephesians is about, this is what the Thessalonians are about, one sentence. Okay. This is how each of the Gospels is different. Um, Matthews is the most Jewish. Luke is the most universal because he's the only Gentile writer of anything in the Bible. You know, Mark is the shortest, but he's the action one. The reason it's shortest is because everything in Mark says, and then immediately it happened. And, you know, and, uh, and without delay, this was what occurred. You know, that's Mark, right? Um, and John is the most theological. It's the one that starts out with this grand theological vision of, of Jesus in, in eternity, you know, being with the Father. You need to know every book, especially, ideally, the whole Bible, but at least be able to tell the story of the Old Testament and be able to identify what each of the New Testament books is about in one or two sentences. Once you're able to do that, and you sit down with any good study Bible, and it'll give you everything you need. In a few hours, you, you know, two hours, you can have all the information you need to be able to do that. Write it down, study it, know what the various books are about. And then it will all together start making more sense to you. Does that make sense? That's exactly what Stephen did mm -hmm. on the day he was stoned. He gave a, he gave a, a, exactly. a, a, you know, a review of everything. Of all the Old Testament. I mean, it's a long sermon. The longest, actually all of the sermons are longer than what we read because the longest of the sermons in the New Testament would only take like three or four minutes. And so they obviously were longer in the presentation. Peter did the same thing. You know, the first, the great sermon in, in the second chapter of Acts. He starts, you know, basically with creation. I mean, he starts with the very earliest call of God. So you all need to have a comfort level with that. Um, so let me challenge you with that. Okay. The main points in Galatians, again, recognizing the two big issues. That you have to be a Jew to become a Christian and don't listen to Paul because he's not an apostle. The, the main points are that Paul is a true apostle by special appointment. And not only in Galatians, but elsewhere as well, Paul makes the very strong argument that he's as much an apostle as anybody because he had a special, um, a special revelation of theophany, and I was struggling with whether, you, whether to use that word. A theophany means an appearance of God, that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and that he then was taken into the, the, the Corinthians, he was taken into the, the uh, third heaven and taught and trained and given knowledge of this stuff. The requirement for being an apostle was that you would have been around with Jesus during his, his ministry so that you could learn from him, and secondly, that you be a witness to the resurrected Jesus. Well, Paul claimed both of those things. Only both of them happened after Jesus died and was resurrected, but the resurrected Jesus appeared to him, and then he was taught by Jesus, but in a miraculous way. So Paul argues that his apostleship is true, and the accusers don't have a right to say that about him. And by the way, and you'll read this word, these Jewish Christians who were trying to convince, they tried first in Antioch, and they also, then they tried in the, the churches in Galatia to convince Gentiles that they had to become Jews in order to be Christians. You have to be circumcised, follow the Mosaic Law. They are commonly called Judaizers. 
The more technical word for them historically is Ebionites. It was the Ebionite movement. You may not run across that one, but uh, Ebionites. There were there were more there were fancier historical words for all of the major heresies and you know and heretical movements, and one of them was Ebionitism. Um, so the Judaizers. Okay. Second point: salvation is by grace alone through faith. We cannot be saved by works or by the law, which means getting circumcised isn't going to help you one bit. Not eating shellfish. There's no spiritual upside to that. Not following the law or following the law is not an issue of salvation. Not since Jesus. Okay. Third, through Christ we are heirs to God's promised redemption and are set free. Our salvation, our redemption is by the grace of Jesus Christ, by nothing we do. And therefore we are set free by Jesus' act, not by anything that we can contribute. And finally, number four, we must use our Christian liberty to serve God and do good for other people. This is a point he makes in Galatians, that now that you've been given freedom, you have a responsibility to how you use it. That's a much bigger issue even in Ephesians. Much of Ephesians has to do with the fact that now you have been set free, you have a responsibility to live in a certain way. Okay. Now, I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to talk about this, give you some, uh, a couple of verses, and then I think uh, we'll take a break. The book of James, almost certainly the first book written in the New Testament, talks about, the theme of James is, faith without works is dead. Okay, which makes it sound like you can have all the faith you want, but you still have to have works in order to be saved. The second book written in the New Testament is the book of Galatians by Paul. James was written by James the just, the half-brother of Jesus. Um, and Paul says, works will not benefit you in terms of salvation. You cannot be saved. And, and whether or not you have good works, circumcision, following the law, whatever, will have no effect, positive or negative, on your salvation. Sounds like those two things are contradictory. But in fact, they're not. For several reasons. One, I've got Paul and James here. So this would be primarily the book of Galatians and the book of James. <laughs> the concern is Paul is addressing legalists, the Judaizers, the people who are saying you must follow the law, be circumcised, etc., in order to be saved. So that's the thing he's addressing. And so he's countering the legalists, the Judaizers. James, on the other hand, is speaking to libertines, the sort of people who said, I can go out and have a, you know, three-day orgies twice a week, and then all I have to do is say, I'm sorry, Jesus, and I'm fine. Because I'm saved in Jesus. Amen, hallelujah. Okay? <laughs> they were addressing the opposite ends of the problematic spectrum. James had people who were saying, I can do anything. There is no such thing as sin for me, basically, because I'm saved by Jesus. Paul was dealing with people who were saying, you have to follow the law, or you're not saved. The emphasis under Paul is justification before God by faith, meaning salvation, justification. You are made just, you are saved, redeemed before God entirely by faith, not by works. Paul is talking about vindication before men <coughs> by works. When James says faith without works is dead, he doesn't mean faith without works means you're not saved. It means... You say you have faith? I will show you my faith by how I live my life, James says. The analogy, and I struggled for years, and most of you have heard this, the analogy I finally came up with about James's point is one characteristic of all life, of everything that's alive, is movement. If something doesn't move ever, now it may move slowly, okay? The, you know, the redwoods, you don't see them move very fast. But if you come back a thousand years from now, you can tell they've been moving. All living things show motion. If you had a horse, and it's been laying on its side out in the field for three weeks, and it has not moved, you better put dirt over it, because it's dead. Right? James is saying, you claim to have faith, but if there is no visible movement as a result of your faith, if there is no kind of evidence at all that you mean it when you say you have faith, that there's something really there, then that faith is dead. You better put dirt over it. And in fact, he goes on to say that faith probably was never really there in the first place. You're just claiming it. So the difference, they actually are not saying a different thing. 
Paul is talking about what leads you up to salvation, what is required for salvation, and it does not include works. James is saying, once you are saved, or you claim you're saved at least, if you don't have some evidence of that in terms of how you're living your life, then I don't believe you. If you ever had any faith, it's dead. Put dirt over it. They're not contradictory. One is talking about what leads you to salvation. The other is how you should act once you are saved. And then if you don't show any sign, no movement, no life to your faith, then you probably don't really have faith. That's what James' point is. Faith without works is dead. Put dirt on it. The perspective, saving faith is a gift. Under Paul, under James, mature faith in action. Once you have that faith, what will it look like? The result, under Paul, uh, received as an eternal position by believing in Christ, not by any works, not by action, not by circumcision, not by not eating bacon, not by any of that. I told you guys about my Jewish friend that I invited to come to our Easter celebration. Um, and I said, and we'll, we'll feed you afterwards. We have a free breakfast. We'll give you pancakes and bacon. And I knew what I was saying. And he went, oh, the Jewish dilemma, free bacon. <laughs> And under James, the result is that we've demonstrated by our lives daily proof because we behave like Christ. One is what gets you to salvation. That's what Paul is addressing. One is if we truly are saved, how will that look to the world? You see the difference? They, Luther was wrong, sorry Marty, in, how, in his perception. Because James in no way is saying works are necessary to be saved. He's saying if you are saved, then somebody ought to be able to tell it. Or else there's a problem. Is that good? Clear on that? Okay. Um, some other verses. Galatians 2, 20, 21. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The act of Christ on the cross for us is completely sufficient. We can't add anything to that as necessary for salvation. Which is one of the reasons, in addition to the fact that it's not in what we consider the Bible, you know, it's only, there's only a reference in the Apocrypha, this is why I don't, and most Protestant theologians, do not accept the doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory in the Catholic faith is basically a place where when you die, you're not yet clean enough to get into heaven, so you must go to an intermediate place and get scrubbed really hard for some period of time, depending on how dirty you are, until you are cleaned up sufficient that you are worthy of heaven. Well, the problem I have with that is the same problem that Paul had with talking to the church of Galatia, is, is not the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf sufficient? If you're telling me I have to go someplace and go through a spiritual scouring for some period of time before I then am worthy of heaven, de facto, that means that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was by itself not sufficient to save me or to make me worthy of heaven. I cannot accept that because that diminishes the sacrifice of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross was, and was completely sufficient. Efficacious is the word. Sufficient for my salvation. And by the way, my, when I make comments like that, I'm not being anti-Catholic. There are differences between what we believe and what they believe, and or what other faiths believe. And we need to understand that there are differences. I have said I have friends who are Catholics who love Jesus, and I look forward to seeing them in heaven so I can go, neener, 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 I told you. <laughs> but they love Jesus, and so we will be there. And there are going to be some things that they're going to poke me in the nose and say, ah, you got that wrong, didn't you? Okay? I'm fine with that. But that doesn't mean we, have, we don't have differences in our theology. Yes, Flora. Um, for the Jewish people, they told you they don't believe in a hell. That there isn't a hell for them. Is that... Is that your understanding? There are di different Jews have different beliefs in that. The concept of Sheol, the place of darkness that spirits are condemned to, uh, unrighteous spirits are condemned to after death, is a long time standing historical belief. Mod more modern Jews, more liberal Jews, do not conceive of any, any uh, hell. In fact, most of them don't perceive of any heaven. Even though, you know, Maimonides, 12th century, 
probably the foremost teacher in the history of the Jewish faith, Maimonides has 13 points, the premises, on which he, that he says define what Judaism is. It includes life after death, both for the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay? So there is built into that a belief in the condemnation to Sheol, you know, the word for hell. That's the word Hades. That's where we get the original, the, the original concept that comes from the Old Testament, not the New. You know, Jesus talks about, depart from me, you are cursed in the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. So there's a lot of that in the New Testament. But there's, there is basis for it in the Old Testament, but not as specific a language. But the great teachers, the sages, the prophets of the Old Testament, like Maimonides and others, very clearly had a conception that there would be eternal life for everyone, including those who are unrighteous, would suffer the place of darkness. Okay? But again, most, you know, most Jews, almost, well, the vast majority of Jews today are completely secular. You know, the Judaism that they have is entirely cultural or biological because there is a genetic sense in which someone is descended is, uh, from the Jewish people is a Jew. Um, and yet most of them do not have religious beliefs. They have, you know, they're very modern, liberal, no particular religious orientation at all. That's predominant in the Jewish faith, as it is in the Christian faith, by the way. Okay. Um, okay. And again, Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. The next time somebody tells you it's a sin to play cards or go to a movie or dance, quote this to them. Okay? None of those things are in Scripture. Or drink a glass of wine. It says don't be drunk. It does not say you can't drink. Mm -hmm. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In addition to the slavery, the yoke of slavery that the Judaizers were trying to place on the Galatians in terms of requiring them to follow the Mosaic Law, we Christians have an unnatural habit of trying to add our own yokes of slavery in terms of things that are not in Scripture that we try to insist on people doing. If you don't fulfill these expectations, you're a sinner. I mentioned to you, you know, that that people I know that that to become a member of a church, they have to sign a document that says they will not go to a movie, they will not dance, they will not play cards, um, they'll do none of those things, or they can't become a member of a church. Show me yeah. where it says that. When we take the, the, our preferences, our social expectations, and we make them equal to the expectations God has given us in His Word, that's a sin. Okay, it's not just not a good idea, it's a sin. Because it's idolatry to take anything human and set it on the same level as the things of God. And that doesn't mean, you know, going, going to all kinds of dances or going to some kind of movies or playing certain kinds of cards, you know, gambling. I, I'm saying that there's, there are extremes of those that are really bad. But they are not inherently an evil, not to the same extent as committing adultery or lying about a neighbor or stealing or killing or, you know, the many things that, that are talked about. Mark? Well, what's well, the other way? If you can love your fellow man and you be a Christian, then there will be times when you will afford all of those activities in the interest exactly. of their well-being. So, but not because it's a sin, but because it's not profitable yeah. in terms of your witness to the other brother. It's a higher way. It's a way of showing your love and your care for those around you. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, whereas the law will say, not past this point, grace has no limit. <coughs> <laughs> and I have no difficulty with people who, of their own volition, say, for instance, I'm not going to drink. You know, I, 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 have, I know people, I have relatives, or even I'm just aware that drink is a real problem for a lot of people. And so therefore, I'm not even going to have a glass of wine with dinner. I completely respect that. It's when they say, I'm not going to have a glass of wine because it's a sin. That's where there's a problem. Okay? I have no problem with anybody who chooses not to do anything with those things. But when a church requires you to sign a document swearing you won't do that or you can't be a member... That's, a, that's what I have a problem with. Uh, but certainly, we, it's for freedom. Now, I mentioned the Jerusalem Council, that the Jerusalem Council agreed with Paul and Barnabas and Peter in terms of not requiring circumcision. But if you go back and read Acts 15, James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, who gave the declaration, the conclusion of what they had decided, he, they write it as a letter to send out. And he says, you're not required to follow the law, but do these things. Don't eat animals, animal flesh with blood still in it. You know, don't, and he, there's, there's four things. He lists. And you're going, well, he's, he says that you don't have to follow the law, and then he gives them legalistic requirements. No, what he says is, 
Because the Jew, these are the things that the Jews are offended by. If you do these things and you are seen to be doing those things, because those were, he lists four things that the, the Gentiles were prone to do. You know, that was common amongst Gentiles. If Gentiles were seen doing those things by Jews, they would find it so offensive that they would not listen to the witness of Jesus from those Gentiles. And so it's entirely a matter of what's gonna, what is going to support or diminish your testimony. Don't do anything, as Paul talks about, you know, don't do something because of brother to stumble. Don't do anything that is going to, to cause people not to accept or receive the gospel of Jesus from your lips. Do not offend them. Not because that's going to make a difference in your salvation, or even that they're inherently evil necessarily, but rather because it's a bad witness. I had a friend, Bill, Bill Buchanan, who used to say, uh, he'd done something wrong, he got angry or whatever, he'd go, oh man, I blew my witness. Okay? That's what James is talking about in Acts 15, that's what Paul talks about in several places, is not, you have to do this because you're sinning if you, know, if you do, but rather, don't do something like eating food sacrificed to idols. Paul says, you know, that means nothing. Food sacrificed to idols, the idols are nothing. That's nothing to me, but if my eating that food is going to cause a real spiritual problem for a brother, I'm not going to do it. Okay, Lorette? Are we under a moral law? Yes. The Old Testament law, um, boy, we're just going everywhere, aren't we? I'm going to say this, and then we'll take a break. Um, the Old Testament law was of two parts. The, the basis of the law was moral law. The Ten Commandments are an example of that. Um, the only aspect of the Ten Commandments that might possibly be seen as not being moral law is the recognition of the Sabbath, okay? the, the observance of the Sabbath, uh, keep the Sabbath holy. But don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't you know, don't commit adultery, don't lie about your neighbors, etc. All of those, even obey, even obey your parents. Those are moral issues. Those things are still binding on us. Okay, just because Jesus has come does not mean I now have the freedom to lie and cheat and steal and commit adultery and lie on my neighbors. So the moral aspect of the Old Testament law is still there for us. But the priestly <laughs> Part or ritual part of the law, which include the sacrifice of animals. It includes things like, you know, you can sit on a, on a stool that has four legs, but you can't sit on a stool that has three legs. Or you can eat, eat from a bowl that has a lid, but not from a bowl that doesn't have a lid. Or, you know, if you, if you touch a dead body, then you're unclean and you have to wash yourself, and, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. Those were ritual aspects of the law that I believe God gave the, the Israelites in order for them to demonstrate obedience. To, to demonstrate more than just being moral, but actually being uh, living a life, a godly, righteous life, in a way beyond what humans would expect. Because they were his special chosen people. All of the expectations of the ritual law, or priestly law, were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, the most critical part for the Jews of the, of the ritual or priestly law was sacrifice, right? The idea was, if we have sinned, a price must be paid for our sin. And the only price that means anything is the taking of life by the shedding of blood, the highest price that could be paid. Uh, technically, in the Old Testament as well, if I sinned, then the price that should have been paid for my sin was the shedding of my blood, the taking of my life. But God in His mercy said, I won't require that of you. Instead, I will allow you to take an animal that you own. So you're paying a price, okay, because it's, it's your animal, and shed the blood of that animal. Accept responsibility for taking the life of that animal. Okay, I hate to even step on cockroaches. Right? I can't imagine taking lambs on a regular basis or calves on a regular basis and slaughtering. And we think how unpleasant that is. Well, that was the point. And so... And that animal had to be the most pure we could find. No spots or blemishes, no ailments, no not being lame or anything else. It had to be the purest we could. But even as pure an animal as we could find, still isn't perfect. And so any animal that we sacrificed was not sufficient to cover all of our sins for all time. Because for that sacrifice to have covered all of our sins for all time, that animal would have to have not only looked perfect, but truly have been perfect. And that's not possible. Well, the only sacrifice that was able to be made that would meet the requirement to pay for our, all of our sins for all time was a perfect sacrifice. And this is why the only perfect, 
being that has ever existed, the Son of God, was the sacrifice that paid the price for our sins once for all. So the highest point of the priestly law, the sacrificial system, was completely fulfilled by the one perfect sacrifice that does not have to be repeated, unlike, unlike every, all the sacrifices before that. So the priestly law, the ritual law, law, was fulfilled in Christ and is no longer binding. But we still have an obligation to live a moral life. So the moral law is still on us, and we know that. We know it's not our right to kill and commit adultery and you know rape and pillage and lie about our neighbors and all of that. There's no question about that. So we are still under that part of the law. That will, that will not save us or damn us if we accept Christ, but as, as I said in our Bible study, it, it says everyone will come before the great white throne of judgment and will be judged for the actions they've done. The first thing was the book of life will be opened and anyone whose name appears in the book of life, meaning anyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. As Paul says, anyone who has uh, confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Your name will appear there. So the first thing that happens is the dividing between the sheep and the goats, as they talk about, between those that are saved and those who are not. And then those who are saved who are still standing there in front of the throne, they will look at the actions in our lives and for some of us, God will say, the, Jesus will say, the one who sits on the throne of judgment, he will say, you are not a good child, and I am not pleased with you. You are part of my kingdom. You will be with me forever. But it hurt me so much the way you live your life. There will never be a punishment that we will feel more severely than that one. We will still be saved, and there will be healing and reconciliation after that, but just that will be enough for, to break our hearts. And for those who have done well, for Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. There will never be, the riches of all the kingdoms of the earth will be nothing compared to the grace, to the, the joy and the satisfaction and the, the blessing of that. So yes, there will be punishment and blessing in heaven, but I think it will purely be the reaction that we get from Jesus. And I'm talking about for those people who are saved. And we will still be in heaven, and Jesus will love us, and he will forgive us, and we'll get past that. You know, and there will be, while time may not end when we're in heaven, there will be still be time, because otherwise you couldn't walk anywhere. You know, how would you have one foot, one step in front of the other? You don't have time. So we'll get over it, but we'll get there. Any other sermons you want me to preach right now? <laughs> Let's take a break. For the rest of our time, 32 minutes and 29 seconds, we're going to be dealing with um, the letter to the Ephesians, which was written to the city of Ephesus. Maybe. I, I didn't turn it off. Nobody else turned that off, did they? I, Carolyn said just let it run. So, um, Again, Paul's second missionary journey. He visited Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Troas, and he went across through into Europe to what we know as Greece, Corinth, and then he took a boat and he came back to Ephesus. Now, um, Paul ended up with two visits that we were aware of, and sometimes when he was in one place, he would make short visits somewhere else. We think when he was in Ephesus, he may have made a real quick trip back to Corinth, for instance, at one point. Um, and then, that's his second journey. The third missionary journey, he left here. Um, this one, back up. He visited there probably for three months or so. Then, his third missionary journey, he travels up through Asia Minor to Ephesus and ends up staying there for almost three years. I say almost somewhere between two and a half and three years. Because the, the, the writers back then always rounded <coughs> their references. And then from there, he went over to Asia Minor, back down to Corinth, back up. And when he was headed back, he was anxious to get back to Jerusalem by a certain time. And so, as he was coming by, he didn't stop back at Ephesus. Because I'm sure that he felt like if he had gone there again, they wouldn't have let him go so quick. And it's like, okay, yeah, my family lives in the next town over, but if I stop there, we're not going to get home before dark. And I get it, home. okay? That's basically what's going on. So instead, he bypassed it and, go, and stops at Miletus, having sent word, and the elders from Ephesus traveled overland to Miletus, and he met with them there and gave them his final, sort of final farewell. But the point is that Paul visited Ephesus itself at least twice, once for three months and once for perhaps three years, the longest period that he was in any one location, and uh, teaching 
We believe that his first visit, he may have initially planted a church. Other people, as I, as I told you, um, we, we know that John, the apostle, became the elder and bishop of that region. That Timothy spent a time as the pastor and sort of church leader in that area. Timothy, who was the one of the primary um, acolytes initially, sort of a young follower of Paul that he taught. Now, the city of Ephesus, why such a big emphasis on Ephesus? Because Ephesus was probably the most important city between Rome and Antioch. And it's Antioch of Syria, where Paul and Barnabas started the church and where they lived. Antioch was the third biggest city in the Roman Empire, after Rome and Alexandria, then came Antioch. But Ephesus, the location of Ephesus, it was a port city. Uh, trade from, uh, I mentioned to you last week, that a trade from over in Europe, Rome and other places, even Spain, usually would come through the Corinth uh, Isthmus there, they would be carted across that, that narrow stretch of land. And one of the major ports they would feed is Ephesus. Ephesus was the primary port serving all of Asia Minor. There were other ports, of course, but Ephesus was the largest one, the most significant one. Ephesus was considered the most important city between Rome and Antioch. And so, since Paul's desire was to reach as many people as possible, it made perfect sense that he would go to the city that was a major port city, a lot of traffic in and out, a lot of people coming through there, a large population, and so Ephesus was very, very important in the Roman Empire and important to Paul. Paul was very much an urban missionary. Okay, Paul was not a country preacher. Paul's ministries were to urban centers and usually substantial urban centers. His first missionary journey, he visited these sort of medium-sized towns. But following that, he tended to go to more significant cities, cities like Corinth and Ephesus. Um, even Thessalonica and Philippi were major commercial centers because they were right on the Via Ignatia, which was the way, you know, the, the main highway that traveled, that went from Byzantium, major international capital, through overland to Rome, traveled right through here. In fact, if you go to Philippi today, they have, there's a stone marker that's been there for 2,000 years that says Via Ignatia. It was the major highway. And so all of those towns along there would have been recipients of a huge amount of traffic and therefore commerce, and they became substantial cities. Paul focused on major, or at least medium to major, population centers in his ministry. So Ephesus was right in his wheelhouse. Okay. Now, today, Ephesus is ruins. The, since it was a port city, the port silted up. It's at the mouth of a river. The port silted up. If you go there today, the actual water of the Aegean Sea is like, I think, three, I think it's three miles away from where the harbor edge used to be. Well, it became impractical at that point to use the harbor. And they also, there were military conquering, there were natural disasters, there's all sorts of reasons. This is what the main part of Ephesus used to look like. I say main part because this, I think this is inaccurate, but we don't know how to draw it. This area here, and then this is a hillside. Okay, this is like a ravine that runs down in between a hill here and a hill here. Um, those would have been populated. In fact, they're just now, here you see terrace houses. These terrace houses literally are stepped up the hillside. And the roof of one would have been the, the patio of the next one. Um, and they go up like that. They're just now uncovering more and more of ter those terrace houses. They estimate they've only actually uncovered maybe 5% of the ancient city of Ephesus. Because once it was no longer viable economically, they deserted it. And they started taking stones away to build other things. Ancient Ephesus, a sign of its importance was it was the home, and I don't think it shows here. It would have been up in here somewhere. The temple to um, Artemis of the Ephesians, okay? The temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And people came from all over the ancient world to worship at the temple of Artemis. That is, everybody who worships Artemis. Um, she, uh, this enormous edifice, people who in the ancient times had visited others of the ancient wonders of the world, came to the temple of Artemis and they said, the rest of them pale by comparison. You know, it was a spectacular thing. Uh, later on, it's, it, it was burned by a crazy guy. 
it suffered from an earthquake, and then they started taking pieces of it to other places. For instance, there's, there are buildings in um, Istanbul that have stones in them from the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Mm. So our, it was a huge place, giant theater. You know, the, the theater, if I'm remembering right, seated like 20,000 people. Um, still there today. Okay. Uh, there's, up, this is the upper level, and there were various, the Temple of Domitian, lots of temples. Trajan was one of the emperors, Fountain, the Gates of Hercules, uh, the Temple of Hadrian. You'll notice, temples, Domitian was an emperor. He was, Domitian was the one who insisted he be called Lord and God when you spoke to him. Um, you had other temples. There was a brothel here, which is called the House of Love in some, some uh, maps. The uh, Library of Celsus. The commercial agora, the marble street, this, um, this road here led out to the harbor, which shows right there. Right now the harbor is like over here, okay, long ways away. This is what it looks like today. This is still a drawing, but it shows some of the ruins. Ephesus today is perhaps the most important archaeological site in the world. It is one of the most visited and certainly one of the most photographed. This area up here, the Odeon, would have been right here. It's, it's actually not in this, in this part of the picture. And then this is this path they called the, the Coretes Street or the Street of Coretes. Um, you get here the Temple of Hadrian. This was the House of Love, the brothel. The Celsus Library, the gates of Memnius and uh, Myth, uh, Myth, Mithridates. The Marble Street, the theater, and then the down here again would have been the, the Harbor Way or the Arcadian Way. Um, if you go today, this is what it looks like. But the thing is, this is the terrace houses. They believe they went all the way up this hillside and probably up this way as well. They're just beginning, even though it is one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. And it's, it's very cool to go in the, in the terrace houses. If you've not been to, to Ephesus, you got to go. It's, it's a requirement. Right Now, during the time that Paul was in Ephesus, we're told in the book of Acts that he lectured every afternoon. Now, this is the days before air conditioning, right? And this is on the AG in the Mediterranean Sea. The afternoons would get very hot and humid. And so there was a hall, a public hall, that was used in the morning. It's called the Hall of Tyrannus. And Paul rented it in the afternoons, and he would use it to teach in the afternoons when nobody else wanted to use it. Okay, because he could get it cheap and it was available. And so, my old pastor, Earl Palmer, and I have talk, talked about the fact that how exciting it will be someday, because they're uncovering all this stuff all the time. If someday they find, a lot of buildings are identified by marble, you know, by, as I say, the Via Ignatia, and a lot of them have labels <laughs> carved in stone, so they're still there. If we find some place that is called the Hall of Tyrannus, then we will know exactly where it was that Paul preached or taught for two and a half years. Two and a half to three years. Okay? Um, this is that street of Paredes. Okay. Uh, looking at it from up here, looking down toward the Celsus Library, that's what this looks like. Okay? And this is actually not very many people compared to the way it usually looks. Okay? It is hugely popular. It's, sometimes it's shoulder to shoulder. But all of these buildings down through here, that's the famous, and I'll show you another picture of the temple of the uh, Library of Celsius. In, inside the temple, the, the terrace houses that they're just beginning to really get into, and they have a place that you can walk through them, walk through several levels of them. This is a mosaic that's on the floors, and I actually took this through glass plate because they have places where you walk across glass or plexiglass, and you can look down and see. And so the wealth of these people is indicated by the fact that this is mosaic, and they're beautiful mosaic. It's a it's a lion with the head of a bull. It's like what size is uh, probably, I'd say 15 by 8 or something like that. I mean, it's the size of a, of a room carpet. Okay. This is one, just one of the paintings. People who were wealthy would hire artists to come in, and they would paint portraits of the people on the walls. It's a mural. And there are places like in the kitchen of one of the houses. They've got um, fish and doves and pigeons and various other kinds of animals you would eat. Um, on the wall, just like people who get by tile, you know, with fruit and things on them. Except they had somebody paint that. Well, you can make the tour through the terrace houses now and see all that kind of stuff. And it is quite extraordinary. This is one of the most photographed ruins in the world. This is the Celsus Library, which was a gift from a son to his father in honor of his father. 
Um, and you can go inside there. In fact, Windstar Cruises, the company that I'm going to, I hopefully we've not signed the agreement, will be talking on again in, the, um, in November. They have um, the next trips that they're doing to Ephesus, they're doing a special thing where they will have a nighttime banquet inside here. With, when after the gates are closed and nobody else can go in there, uh, the people who take this excursion, it's one of the premier excursions they have, you can go in and you'll have dinner inside the, the Library of Celsus. Um, but very cool, this is the gates of uh, Mimnius and Mithridates. This is the arena. Now, if you read in the book of Acts, the story about where in Ephesus, because Ephesus was where the temple of, of uh, Artemis was, and a lot of the people made money off of this religion. For instance, the silversmiths would make small silver idols of Artemis and sell them. Well, Paul shows up, and the other Christians, starts preaching, people start getting converted, and they don't want to worship Artemis anymore, which means they don't want to buy the, the idols anymore. So the silversmith in the book of Acts is threatened by, his, his, his income is threatened. So he starts, he gets everybody in a row, and they all get excited, and they want to do something about Paul. And so they all end up in this arena, and for hours, it says, they're stomping their feet, yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Because the Artemis, he, Artemis was, a, was a god that was worshipped throughout the Roman Empire, but the Artemis of the Ephesians is a different image. They thought they had a special artist, you know. Uh, if you've ever seen the little statue, I should have one here, of, it, it looks like a woman except she's got like 30 breasts. You ever seen that? Okay. She was a fertility goddess, okay. Um, and so, and they said that they had gotten that image from a, a meteorite fell to earth. Um, so, okay. so this is... Where exactly where that happened and still available today. This is where the, the riot took place. Paul wanted to go in and speak to the crowds and his companions wouldn't let him because they were afraid they'd tear him apart. Yes? Help me. Okay. Uh, this, in Acts 19, it talks about the temple of Diana. Diana. Is um, that the same? Diana and Artemis. Well, they're screaming, great is Artemis of Ephesians, and that's in Acts, so keep looking. Um, there were other temples there. I am drawing a blank as to whether Diana and Artemis was the same. I was thinking Artemis and Aphrodite. Is it one uh, woman's name and one Greek name? <clears throat> Diana is the hunter. Yeah, I know, but there, there's always, the, the Greeks and the Romans had the same gods and goddesses, they just had different names for them. But whether or not Artemis is the Greek name, I don't remember what the, uh, the, what the Latin name was. Anyway, yes, Karen. Uh, what's the arena called again? Uh, it's, it's just the theater of Ephesus. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so you get the idea. That's all still there. Now, the book of Ephesians. Um, get past my picture slides here. Uh, Ephesians is one of the books that some people question whether or not Paul wrote it, but most people, you know, because it says... Paul wrote it. it, in the, you have to, you're questioning the very reliability of the book if you doubt that Paul wrote it, because it says, it says itself Paul wrote it. Um, it probably written in 60 to 63 during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. In fact, I lost my formatting there. Um, in fact, this is one of four letters that are referred to as the prison epistles. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon all were written from Paul's imprisonment in Rome the first time, when he was two years under house arrest in Rome. And so this is one of the, those, and he talks in here about his imprisonment, about, I'm a, you know, I'm a prisoner for Christ, and that's what he's talking to. So the recipients, we believe, is the church in Ephesus. And I say we believe, because if you read the first part of it, it says, Paul to the churches in Ephesus. But the earliest man, you, and that's what almost every, every English Bible says, um, that's all what virtually every translation you have will say Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church in Ephesus. But the earliest Greek versions, the earliest Greek manuscripts we have, do not say Ephesians. And so it's believed, and this letter has almost no specific references to the, to the church in Ephesus. It's not like the, church, the Galatian letter, which is specifically addressing problems the Galatians were having. Um, nor is it like the Philippian letter, which shows a great deal of intimacy and warmth. The Philippian letter, I was a, I was a counselor in a, 
a junior counselor in a Bible camp for years. And so all the junior counselors, we would write letters and things to each other. And on the outside of the envelope, people would always put scripture verses. Okay, favorite scripture verses. Well, Philippians got quoted twice as much as everything else because it's full of so much joy and so much love and so much affection. Um, and clearly, Paul's relationship with the Philippians was very close. But he spent far longer in Ephesus. And you would expect would have had far closer relationship with the people in Ephesus than he did the people in Philippi or anywhere else. You know, even more than Corinth, where he, spent, where he spent 18 months. And yet, you don't get any of that. It is believed, because the earliest manuscripts do not have the word Ephesians in them, that Paul may have written this letter as a more general letter to the churches of Asia Minor, sort of like the book of Revelation is to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Paul may have written what's called a circular letter, which was intended to be shared by a bunch of different churches. You know, that it be read by the Ephesians and then sent on. And, and we know Paul did that sort of thing because he says, make sure you read the letter that I sent to Laodicea, okay, which is one of the churches of Revelation. We don't have any letters to Laodicea. That doesn't exist anymore. But it may be that Paul wrote this letter intending that a number of churches read it and benefit from it because he's talking about issues that relate to all of them, but that the most important church, the biggest one, which was the Basilica of St. John, by the way, and it's where St. John traditionally is buried. You go there today, the Basilica, and it's just a ruin. Nowhere in Turkey are any of these big churches still in existence, unless they're either mosques or, or museums now. But there is a place, which is the, I should have brought you a picture, which is the temp, the uh, un understood to be the burial place of John. There's also the House of Mary, because you remember when Jesus was on the cross, and Mary and John were standing at the foot of the cross. Jesus said, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. In other words, he gave Mary and John to, to each other to take care of. And there's very strong tradition, I say tradition because we don't have the writing, tradition that when John went to Ephesus to live, which we know he did, there's a lot of record of that from people who knew him there, um, that he took Mary with him. And that she lived there until her death. In fact, you can visit the traditional house of Mary in outside Ephesus, which we did. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, a huge amount of history there. The Basilica of St. John is, if this was written to the church of Ephesus, then that Basilica eventually was built by that church, because that was the church in, in Ephesus. And you can go and visit the ruins of that church today. But the, the question when we say that it was written to the church in Ephesus in Asia Minor, or possibly as a circular letter, because the characteristics are not as intimate as you would expect. He's not addressing specific issues in the way you would have expected if he's writing to a church that he knows well, um, and etc. And the earliest manuscripts don't include the word Ephesus in it. Again, that in no way challenges the reliability of this as being the Word of God or written by Paul, because we know from Paul's own writing that he did write circular letters, meaning letters that were intended to be shared, you know, read by one church and then sent on to the next one and then sent on to the next one. You couldn't do an email blast and send it all of them at once. Okay, it had to go overland, and it that meant that from time to time it would go to one church and it was intended to then be shared in, in a circle. That's why it's called a circular letter. Okay? Any questions about that? Major theme, the gracious position of redeemed Christians and how this should be reflected in how they live their lives and especially in the unity of the church. Some people would say that the main theme of Ephesians is the church, which is the body of Christ. Um, you can uh, Two verses that we might look at as being representative of, um, of the book of Ephesians, especially. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. I probably quote this verse as much as any because, and this is a completely consistent with the book of Galatians. This too was a verse that influenced the Reformation, although the whole book of Galatians did. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Some translations say the free gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So you can see how that, not by works so that no one can boast, is exactly the same message as Galatians. But you can really see Ephesians being in two parts. The first part is 
the, the blessing that we have as being redeemed people by the grace of Christ. And the second part of it, part two, is, and now here's how you ought to live because of that. Not because it saves you, because you're saved completely apart from any works you do. But once you are saved as Christians, as the church, we should live in a certain way. To do the good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And the second passage, Ephesians 4, 1 to 4, as a prisoner for the Lord, remember he, we believe this is written while he was in prison in Rome, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the peace of the Spirit through the bond of unity. That's the start of the second part of the book, which focuses on how we then are supposed to live our lives and especially how we're supposed to live our lives as Christians in unity with other brothers and sisters. One of the problems that the church ran into, and it was likely this was true in any church that was made up of both Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, converts to, Judy, to Christianity, is that there tended still to be some divisions. The Jewish Christians especially, even if they weren't victims of the Judaizers, even if they don't, didn't expect circumcision, there still was always a sense in which they didn't quite fit in with the Gentile believers. They still were a people apart. You know, they were still, in their mind, still a little bit the people of the promise, even over and above the, the, the Gentile Christians. And apparently that, that sense of division, of disunity, even if it wasn't outright fighting, they just didn't connect with each other the same way they did amongst the Gentile Christians and then amongst the Je Jewish Christians. They didn't cross that border very well. And so, part of what this is all about in terms of the unity of the body probably was addressing some of those kinds of problems, especially between the Jewish Christian believers and the Gentile Christian believers, who never did quite jive. You know, there was a history of real frustration, even animosity between Jews and Gentiles anyway, um, and so there's a sense in which they never quite got over that. Very quickly, part one is the position of the Christian, that is the redeemed and blessed position of the Christian. Paul starts out giving praise for the redemption, recognizing the glory of our salvation. Um, he, he gives a sal salutation. He talks about being chosen by the Father for the work, being redeemed by the Son, being sealed by the Spirit. This is one of the places where we see in Paul a very clear presentation of Trinity. He talks about chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. For those of you who are in our systematic theology class, and shame on anybody who's not, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the doctrine of God, and we're going to be talking about Trinity as one aspect of that. Well, this is one of the places where Paul clearly reflects a Trinitarian doctrine, that all believers, all followers of Christ, are chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. Okay? He then has, gives a prayer for revelation, for God revealing himself to the churches, he then talks about the, the position of the Christian, of being redeemed, of being a special and chosen people, individually first and then corporately. And that's where he begins to get into the issue that the church, with a capital C, is the sign of God's presence on earth. And he talks about the fact, when, when he talks about our, our redemption, he says, you are not just saved for your sake. You are saved for your sake, but it's much more than that. You are, sa you are saved in order to honor God. Your salvation is an act of honor to the Lord God Himself. And the existence of the church as a unified body is one of the greatest testimonies to the Lord. And so you have a responsibility to demonstrate that unity and to live in a certain way as an example of who God is. Because the church is a reflection of God Himself on earth, right? The body of Christ. And then a prayer for realization. Then we get to part two, which is, once the position of, of the redeemed Christian is established and, and lifted up, he then talks about the practice of being a Christian. It's all in line. You can look at it. Um, he talks about the unity of the church. Again, he exhorts the people to unity. He explains what unity means, that we are one in Christ. And then he says, God has miraculously given us what we need to maintain that unity through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You remember he talks about the fact that um, all Christians are given gifts of the Spirit for the sake of the body. Every one of us, as we believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit fills us, and in filling us, he gives each one of us some gift that the body needs. 
you combine all of those gifts in unity as one, and all of the needs of the body of Christ are met. Is that at the time of salvation? That the Holy Spirit enters? Yes. Yes. Um, the issue of the second filling, you know, the promise is that the Holy Spirit is a gift to everyone who accepts Christ. And the, we get into, some churches have other doctrines uh, than that. But the indication is that the manifestation of the gifts of, of the dramatic gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy, some of the others, are special demonstrations of God's power that comes afterwards. But it's not that, the, that once somebody accepts Jesus Christ, the gift of the Spirit is theirs. They are given the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then he talks about the purpose of the gifts, you know, how they are to work together, how they are to interact. And then he goes on to, to talk about holiness in life. Put off the old man. You're not what you used to be. You're a completely different person. You're not to live the way the world lives because that was the old creature. You are to put on the new man in Christ, or the new person in Christ. Okay? He talks about when we don't do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit. When we don't recognize the presence of God in our lives as believers, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And that we should uh, instead walk as children of the light by being filled with the Spirit. He then goes into responsibilities in the home and at work. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, even as the church submits to Christ. And so many people have taken that as meaning, okay, husband comes first. But then he says something very important. That they, don't, they don't quote nearly as often. He says, and husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. There really is a sense, and some of it is the passages leading up to that, you know, uh, 521 and others, that Paul is talking about a mutual kind of submission in various ways. And that the, the wife is to submit to the, to the husband, and it says, respecting your husbands. And it, and for the women in the group, if you haven't figured this out, respect is one of the most important things for men. If a man feels respected, put up with a lot. If he doesn't feel respected, nothing else is going to be okay. All right? And that's a real issue, and Paul addresses that here. But then Paul sa says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and even to the point of giving himself up. In other words, be prepared to sacrifice even your life for your wife doesn't sound to me like that's an oppressive kind of domination. Okay? Not at all. It's a very different kind of thing. And then, children, obey your parents. And, and by the way, tomorrow when we talk about Trinity, we are going to talk about how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, are completely equal in authority, are completely equal in power, you know, co-equal in all attributes of, of divinity, and yet... The Son and the Spirit willingly subordinate themselves to the will of the Father. Not because they're less, or because they have to, but because that is their desire. Okay? And so when, when we talk about this kind of mutual submission between husbands and wives, it is not a power issue. That's not how Paul's presenting it. That's not how God intends it. It is an issue of recognizing that for Carolyn and I, there are things that I provide in our relationship. Those are, that's my role, my responsibilities. Not because I'm stronger or bigger or whatever, but because that's what I provide. And she provides certain things. We have responsibilities, and we respect that in each other. You know, she sometimes calls me the alpha wolf. You know, if you know anything about dogs and wolves, it's the alpha wolf. And yet, I consider us complete equals in that. Um, I think we fulfill this kind of responsibility without any sense in which one person is lording it over the other. Either direction. Okay? Children, obey your parents. And then, obey your masters, whether that be your bosses, or slaves obey your masters. Now, Paul not, is not here advocating an unjust kind of situation. He is simply saying that God is in control of all things. And whatever circumstance you find yourself in, that is God's will. If, you're an, if your employer is abusive, that doesn't mean you can't quit and take another job. But don't undermine and malign and gossip about and do everything you can to try to diminish and destroy your boss. That's not the answer. If you're going to work there, obey your boss. If you're not going to obey your boss, then get another job. Pretty straightforward. And then it, when he talks about slaves obey your masters, he, uh, by the way, when he says children obey your parents, he also says, and fathers do not drive your children to anger. In other words, fathers have a responsibility here too. Okay, you can't... You can't 
be a terrible father and expect your children to be good. And when he talks about slaves obey your masters, he talks about masters, you know, you have a responsibility for how you treat your, uh, your slaves, even if, especially if, you're both believers. Yes, Laura. But was there a time when if you were a slave, that that was your master for life? You didn't have an option? Oh, yeah, you're all. Good job? Yeah, I, I'm not, those are two different things. Don't, I'm not saying that slaves could say, okay, I don't want to obey my master, so I'm going to leave. Because if you were a slave and you ran away and you got caught, you could be executed. That's not a good idea. We have a, we'll talk about that in the book of Philemon. Because the book of Philemon is about Paul writing to the master of a runaway slave saying, take him back and don't punish him. All right? So what I'm saying is that in the case of slaves, you know, trust God in that situation. We'll talk about that under Philemon. And then conduct and spiritual conflict. Here is where Paul recognizes the fact that we do have spiritual battles. And he talks about the full armor of God. Okay, the belt of truth, the best breastplate of righteousness, uh, the shield of faith, the sword of the uh, word of God, the helmet of salvation, that uh, arm yourself with those things because there is spiritual battle to be done. If you have uh, salvation and faith and righteousness and truth and the word of God, those things will make you victorious in spiritual battle. And then... In the spiritual battle, pray for boldness, and then Paul concludes. Six chapters. These are not very long letters. They're not the shortest, but they're not very long. Any questions about any of that? Uh, That's it. I got a comment. Okay? I figured it out. <laughs> Deanna, Deanna and Artemis are the same person. Okay, I, I thought it might be, but I was, it wasn't I like it. In the, book here. the King James, yeah. King James uses it, and in, in the Latin is Deanna. Okay. And the Greek is Artemis. And they're speaking of the same. Which is unfortunate because they spoke Greek, and when they're in the temples, you know, shouting, Great is, is Artemis of the Ephesians, they would not have said Diana of the Ephesians. No. So translating into Latin doesn't make any sense in that case. But in my case, that's what I recommend that's what I remember okay. Acts 19. It was okay. Diana. Any uh Becky. I have a question, it's not on this part, but later part. Um, I know we have a lot of this in the Bible, but I was wondering when we were, we were looking at the, you know, the, some of the buildings and the statues, has there ever been anything archaeological that showed Paul was there or, or no, any that's other what, writings? Or? Um, well, there, I mean, we have a lot of first century writings um, that, that talk about Paul's presence and John's presence. In fact, you know, the early church fathers, there are two generations of church fathers that were alive um, and knew John, okay, when John was there. And so we have their accounts, not just the biblical writings, but we have their accounts of, of what they learned from John because they were discipled by John, okay? And so we, we have a lot of other writings during that time about what was happening in Ephesians and around that area. We don't have any specific archaeological evidence. That's why I say it's kind of thrilling to think that because they've only uncovered maybe 5% or so of, of what was ancient in Ephesus, they may still find it. If they find anything that indicates the Hall of Tyrannus, this is where Paul preached. You know? um, I will say, whenever questions like that come up, the amount of archaeological su support overall for biblical... Uh, things. For instance, a hundred years ago, um, even 50 years ago, it was common for scientists who were not believers to say, oh, well, you know, there's no evidence for any of that stuff archaeologically. Time, and, you know, more and more and more and more and more archaeological evidence, ancient records of other cultures are being found that do demonstrate. And it's like one time after the next, some other piece of the puzzle is being proven in scripture based upon archaeological evidence. And it's astonishing how very little has actually been dug up around the world. Okay, archaeology is a very new science. Okay. And so the more they find, the more evidence there is that this is all falling into place. Uh, um, where are those writings about, you said that John and, I mean, the writings of the early church fathers. Uh, yeah. you know, um, is that what it's called? Yeah. The writings of the early church, early church fathers. fathers. Early Church Fathers, and that's with capital, you know, Early Church Fathers, were the first generation of church leaders after the Apostles. Meaning those who took over responsibilities when the Apostles died. And they're very important because the Early Church Fathers were before the, the, 
the canon was determined. In other words, before we, we nailed down what books we thought were part of the Bible, the, the letters were there and they were floating around, but there's also a lot of other, you know, um, stuff out there. And so the early church fathers, those who'd actually known the apostles and learned from them and discipled by them, were considered hugely authoritative. Not equal to the apostles, but still very, very important. Um, and as I say, we have a lot of writings and records of people who knew John and knew some of the others. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, I'll see some of you tomorrow for systematic theology. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.